Well, hello, welcome fellow freedom lovers. So glad that you can join me today. In this presentation, it's going to be very powerful for those to whom it may apply to. What I'm going to do is to review in great detail a document that I've put together uh, dealing with IRS issues. All right, I call it the elephant gun, one shot IRS killer. And what it is, is a compilation of several different uh, lawful attacks that literally destroy the power, the authority, and the jurisdiction of the IRS. And so this single document can be used in any one of a multiple of circumstances or situations, okay? Those might be the IRS is demanding that you file back taxes, file your 1040s, all right? They may be asking that you pay for back taxes. They may have given you an assessment on their own due to their own courtesy and goodwill. They helped you uh, determine what taxes you should pay and what penalties you should pay. And you didn't have to lift a finger. They did it all for you. <laughs> It may be they are threatening garnishments or tax liens, or they may have already done so. All right, this is a document that can be used to really destroy any retroactive uh, or any actions they may have taken retroactively, okay? Now, that's not to say that they just roll over and play dead in every single instance but it provides you with the legal standing and foundation to stand on securely and hold your position, all right? And uh, just literally destroy them. Now, it's quite common that the IRS, when they send you letters, nobody has the guts to sign them. Look at your letters and see if they're signed. Some may be, most are not. All right, because they know what they're doing is fraudulent and nobody wants to take responsibility. You know, there's an act, there's a maxim of law that states without risk, there is no authority. So unless someone risks putting their name on a document and taking responsibility for what's on that letter or document, that letter has no authority. OK, so learn that right off the bat you can ignore unsigned letters from ghostwriters, okay? And that would be a legitimate uh, cause for refusing it, refusal for cause. All right, so let me get into this document. I'm gonna go through it in some detail, help you understand the contents and the legal and lawful premises for which you can literally destroy the authority and the jurisdiction of the IRS uh, in 99.999% of the cases, unless you're a government employee in Washington, DC, this won't help you, all right? But for everyone else, um, I'll go through this in some detail, and then I'll uh, leave you with uh, uh, the breadcrumbs to follow if you wanna get a copy of this document yourself, okay? So bear with me, let me share my screen and uh, pull it up here and we'll get right into it. All right, so um, right off the bat, up on top, understand we don't use the full zip code. You see here on the, uh, the header, for, uh, your address as the sender, the last two digits, of the postcode that you use, the zip code, uh, identify the post office that is most near you that would be serving this. So we don't use the federal zip code, uh, avoiding federal zones, but you can use the uh, identifier for the post office by using the last two digits, okay? So you see that right up on top. Now, in any correspondence, uh, we always include the uh, commissioner of the IRS, okay? Uh, and you need to make sure that you have the current commissioner because they change from time to time. And then you want to send it to 
whomever sent you the last correspondence or uh, the regional processing center that deals with your area, okay? Now, we always use the certified mail return receipt requested. That's the RRR. Not only to verify that this document is delivered, but we also use that as a document identifier, okay? We can use that as an identifying number to identify the document in any future correspondence, should it be necessary, okay? Now, if you've received some correspondence, uh, you'll make reference to that and attach it with this letter, okay? Um, in this case, a CP503 notice basically saying, hey, you owe us money, send it. That's basically what that is, all right? So make reference to whatever you might be responding to uh, in that section. And the uh, alleged taxes owed on the tracking file number, of course, is the social security account number. And I don't refer that to that as your social security number because it's not yours. It's, it's, it's owned, controlled, and managed by the uh, Social Security Administration. You do not have possessory rights over that. If you have a, a, a social security card, um, you'll notice, I think, on the back, it states that this card is the property of the Social Security Administration or something to that effect, okay? So we start with the affirmation of fact, which is another way of saying an affidavit, okay? Basically uh, using a little bit different terminology, trying to avoid legal terminology and uh, stick in the common law as much as possible, all right? So the affirmation of fact along with a notice of offer of performance to satisfy alleged tax obligations. Now, a notice of offer of performance is a very specific term that's used in the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, all right? And this offers to satisfy alleged tax obligations. So right off the bat in the title, we're indicating a good faith effort to satisfy these obligations, okay? Isn't that nice of you? All right, so uh, we spell our name uh, this way, the first comma, or, or not, not comma, first hyphen middle name, colon last name. The hyphen conjoins the first and middle name, all right? Makes it one and then separates it from the family name. The colon is a separator from the family name. So um, I would be Mark Emery. That's my given name. That's what I go by. And then my family name after that, okay? So this affiant does hereby state, and then here, I'm not gonna read it word for word, but basically we go into the legal status that you're a real living, breathing man or woman upon the land. Uh, you are not a resident of Washington, D.C. Um, your mailing location is above, but that's not your, your residential address, okay? We have to make that distinction. This is where you receive mail, not necessarily a residence. We'll get into that, okay? And then uh, as an affiant here, this is important that we, we basically affirm, we don't swear, all right? We don't make false oaths, as the Bible says, but we'll affirm the following to be true, correct, complete, and not misleading. And we're doing that without the United States as per 26 USC 1746 uh, item number one. You can look that up, okay? Basically, it's a swearing of an oath outside the United States, all right? And of course, we're gonna get into the definition of the United States, but that's basically Washington, D.C. So we're a living, breathing uh, son or daughter of uh, the living God. The mailing location is above. I'm not a resident of a federal or state district within the national or state or regional areas. I do not reside, all right? If you're a child of God, Here's, I claim myself as a sojourning pilgrim acting as an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. That's my stance, okay? Yours might be somewhat different, 
Okay, but we make the distinction that we're not a resident, we're not residing. Okay, so with my belief system, I am an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. Now think about it. Uh, I was in court once, it's, the judge was trying to nail me down on this. And they said, Mark, uh, what's your address? Address, you mean like a permanent address? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, come to think of it, I've never had a permanent address and neither have you, think about it. You've always moved. Even if you're in the same home your entire life, you're not gonna be there forever. You're gonna move on at some point in time. So there is no such thing as a permanent address. Oh, well, I don't have a permanent address, judge. Uh, well, where, where do you live? Where do you keep your your household goods? Where do you where do you uh, sleep at night? And I, I answered, well, I sleep wherever I can hang my hat for the night, <laughs> which is absolutely true. It's uh, nothing misleading about that. Okay. And it changes from time to time. I travel, I move around, I visit. Uh, the earth is the earth is my playground, all right? God gave us dominion over the earth. So I'm a sojourning pilgrim. I move around. I don't have a permanent address, okay? I am not now nor ever have been, at least with fully informed consent, even though I've admitted it on several forms, which I renege right now, but I am not now, nor have I ever been a citizen of the United States, as defined within the limitations of the Declaratory 14th Amendment. So here I renege my signatures. I revoke my signatures. Any previous forms signed, assuming or attesting the contrary, were done with lack of informed consent. In other words, I didn't have the full information. I didn't uh, know what I was signing, in fact. And therefore, that was not my signature. Well, didn't you put your didn't you put your signature on this contract on this piece of paper, not with informed consent? So no, that was not a signature. A signature assumes fully informed consent. So even though you put your name on that paper in ink, and and wrote it in script, that was not a signature. If you lacked fully informed consent, that was fraudulently induced with lack of informed consent, and those documents are hereby nullified, non pro tunk and ab initio, okay? So this paragraph uh, eliminates the possibility for them to bring up some past admission or confession that you made with a previous form that you signed and use it against you, okay? Uh, you're not engaged in any commercial activity involving alcohol, tobacco, or firearms. You're going to see why that's important uh, uh, in just a minute. I'm not a member of the armed forces. I'm not a resident of any of the U.S. territories, all right, or insular possessions. I'm not one listed as block nationals. It's come to my attention that the IRS has assessed a tax against me, which I do not believe is lawful. So you're making a challenge right there, okay? You're contesting it. You're not letting it lie. You're not accepting that as a fact challenging that right up front, or that there is any truth, validity, or accuracy to such an alleged assessment, okay? Now, it's possible that the IRS has made a mistake and has assessed this erroneously without any reasonable or factual basis. However, I do not want to go to the extra time, trouble, or expense having an attorney, CPA, enrolled agent, or other tax professional to dispute the matter. It's my intent to resolve this question with as little hassle as possible, and thus this letter. This is how we're doing it via this letter, okay? So, therefore, this constitutes my good faith offer to pay the alleged tax obligation in full or in agreed, agreed upon installments if and when the IRS can show reasonable and lawful basis for its claim, Okay. So you're not arguing, you're happy to pay. Just show me that you have legal standing to make this declaration against me, this assessment, all right? So you're operating in good faith and clean hands. Although reference is made here in the state statutory language, this goes on to state that uh, you're gonna use the UCC 
basically to explain the nature of your challenge and um, and the lawful basis for it, it goes on to say that these uh, this description, if it's objectionable, if it uh, to the IRS, that uh, you'd be happy to resubmit this without those. Uh, so it goes into a couple paragraphs on that. But then this basically, uh, right out of the UCC, is an offer of performance of necessity to extinguish the alleged tax liability. Now, we never refer to it as the tax liability. It's always alleged. You say I owe it. I'm challenging that fact. Okay, so it's alleged. It's not an agreed upon tax liability. So uh, this is otherwise known in the UCC as an offer to pay in full conditional upon performance of conditions precedent. That would be conditions precedent to the alleged obligation. In other words, there's certain things that need to be in place in order for them to make the demand. All right. And we're going to we're going to demand that to see those, that those things are in place. All right. So the IRS may either accept the offer, they can reject the offer, or they can object to the mode of this offer. Okay. And then we'll resubmit it in a different mode. If the IRS finds it objectionable that I use the statutes in the state civil code, we can resubmit it. Okay. So that's that. So Let's get to the offer to extinguish the alleged tax liability. All right, this is an offer of performance with intent to extinguish the alleged tax liability. All right, and we repeat that several times just to make the point very clear. As noted above, as an aid to understanding the nature and meaning of this offer, please note the following language, okay? From the statutes enacted in virtually every state legislature, which would be the UCC, and those are adopted by the state legislatures verbatim, with the exception of Louisiana. Okay, so every state statutory code has a, has a, a one title that is the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, that's been adopted verbatim, so it's uniform across all the states. Okay, so. From those statutes, uh, setting forth the commonly understood meaning of such an offer, um, generally entitled extinguishment of obligation or similar wording, an obligation is extinguished by an offer of performance made in conformity to the rules herein provided and with the intent to extinguish the obligation. Okay, now there are certain things that must happen, namely, that the uh, person on the receiving end of the offer uh, refuses it, okay? If they refuse it, it's a debt paid. So we go into some wordage on uh, an offer equivalent to payment and what that all means. Uh, performance of condition precedent, basically it's a conditional offer uh, or acceptance. It's like, yeah, okay, you want me to pay uh, X amount of money? I'll pay it conditional upon you establishing your legal and lawful basis to make that demand. Okay. So when a debtor is entitled to the performance of a condition precedent, for example, a debt collector wants you to pay money on a particular debt. Well, as the debtor, you have the right to demand verification that that debt is legitimate. Okay. So that would be a condition precedent to or concurrent with performance on your part, all right? He may make this offer to depend upon the due performance of such a condition. And that's what we're doing. We're saying, yeah, we'll pay. Just show us X, Y, and Z, okay? Um, this is an offer to pay in full or an agreed upon installments, including interest and penalties. It's made dependent upon performance of conditions precedent to which I am entitled by the fundamental principles of American jurisprudence in law. All right, namely, presentation of documentary evidence showing the factual grounds of the alleged tax liability. So here we go down and we list those conditions. All right, number one, 
show me documentary evidence that the office of the Department of the Treasury, the Internal Revenue Service, um, was actually legislatively enacted. Okay, show me that. Show me that Congress even created you in the first place, that you even exist. All right, then show me the codification of that act in the Code of Federal Regulations. All right, so if there were sessions laws where Congress actually legislated those entities into existence, they didn't because uh, um, the Internal Revenue is a private trust. Um, so once they're enacted at the sessions laws, then they have to be encoded in the statutes, step number two, and then step number three, in order for those statutes to be valid, there must be implementing regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations, okay? The CFRs, implementing regulations. If you don't have all three of those, you don't exist. So how can I deal with an entity that doesn't exist, all right? So that's what we're getting at. And then three, show me evidence of the publishing of those acts in the Federal Register, okay? Since you are the proponent of the demand of the claim, you're putting a claim against me, you have the burden of proof um, to show that you have a legitimate claim, okay? All right, so that's just number one. And if that isn't enough, we continue. Paragraph B, show me documentary evidence showing facts necessary to establish that I, the undersigned, a non-U.S. citizen, man or woman, living and breathing in Wisconsin, one of the several states of the United States of America, note the difference between that and the United States, two different entities altogether, as you likely know, am specifically and unequivocally made liable by law for the payment of a particular kind of tax alleged by the IRS, all right? Show me where I'm liable in my legal status, all right? Show me the, show me the code and regulations that allegedly create the liability. No can do, all right? So, but we continue. Then in C, show me the facts necessary to establish that I am subject to the legislative jurisdiction. Show me where you have jurisdiction over me, all right? Regulation and control uh, of the legislative entity which created the tax statutes in the first place, okay? Show me where you have jurisdiction. Show me documentation that identifies the specific property or commercial activity upon which the tax has been imposed. If you can't get jurisdiction on me personally, show me the property that's being taxed, okay? E, show me the facts necessary to establish that such property upon which a tax assessment has been made actually came into my possession, ownership, and control. Then an F, show me the facts necessary to determine how 26 USC, that's the US code, which is 26 is the uh, Internal Revenue Code, section 83 factored into the equation of the alleged amount due and owing. Section 83 basically states that the only thing that can be taxed is a gain on property or commercial activity, okay? So if you, for example, bought Bitcoin and it rose in price and you're subject to the taxes and all the other things are, are in place, then Section 83 says the tax would be applied to the gain. Wages are not gain. You put in the time, you get back compensation. That's a one-for-one -one exchange. There is no gain in that. Income uh, uh, compensation for work is not a gain. That's a whole nother discussion that we can get into, but that's what Section 83 is all about. All right, G, show me any references to the Internal Revenue Code in Title 26 in your, uh, in your response, or sorry, any references in the U.S. Code that you use in your response must include the corresponding implementing regulations 
from the Code of Federal Regulations, CFRs, as represented in the Parallel Table of Authorities, which basically is just that. It's a table that shows on one column, it shows the uh, U.S. Code sections uh, by number. And then on the uh, next column, it shows the uh, CFRs, the corresponding uh, regulations that correspond to that particular statute. Okay. And uh, what you're going to find is that uh, most of the um, codes that the IRS uses, the implementing regulations relate only to Title 27 of the U.S. Code, which is alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Okay, so if you're not involved in, in commercial activity relating to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, chances are um, none of those statutory references that the IRS is using to beat you over the head with apply to you. Isn't that interesting? I get into that in some detail in my book, How I Beat Satan and the IRS. You can find that on Amazon. So, 19, please take note of these seven elements. If they cannot be met, then the IRS has no legal standing to make any demands. And the irrefutable conclusion is that there is no tax liability for me to pay, which I believe to be the case. All right? But I might be wrong. Show me where I've gone wrong. All right, 20, in fact, if in fact the tax liability alleged is a tax for which I, the undersigned, am made liable for by law, and I am subject to the jurisdiction, regulation, and control of the legislative entity, which enacted the taxing statute, which I'm not, and I have taken possession, control, and ownership of the property upon which the legislative body has imposed the tax, then I am certainly entitled to presentation of evidence sufficient to demonstrate the factual validity of these claims. Okay? You're just making a reasonable um, request. You have the right to request these things. Okay? So further, I'm going to present you with the following. I don't have any desire to argue about paying any tax, which I might owe according to law. In fact, I have offered to pay whatever taxes are owing, conditional upon substantiation that those alleged taxes are in fact due and owing according to law. So far, I've not seen or received any substantiation whatsoever, but I'm happy to look at that when you can send it to me. So here, I've diligently researched Title 26 of the U.S. Code, the Internal Revenue Code, and I have found no such code that requires me to file a tax return 1040 or be subject to taxes of any kind, as you allege. I present you with the findings of my research below, and if you know of such a code which is contrary to my findings, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights requires that you identify that code for me, provide the facts as to how that applies to me, and provide the CFRs and case law which has supported the statute so that you can let me know where I've gone wrong. So this is your opportunity. Let me know if I'm in error here. Please correct me. Where have I gone wrong and how the courts have ruled contrary to my assertions? That's all I'm asking from you. So in the law, here's some research that we've done uh, regarding who is liable. So I've discovered that only an individual is required to file a tax return. That's from 26 U.S. Code 6012. And then only under certain circumstances. So in looking at Section 7701, subparagraph A, item 1 of the code, I discovered that the term individual is defined as a, quote, person, unquote, then in checking under 7701A30, I discovered the definition of a United States person as meaning a citizen of the United States, resident of the United States, domestic corporation, domestic partnership, and a domestic trust or a state. Domestic meaning United States. There is no individual 
defined under 7701. Therefore, if it's not defined, I cannot be an individual within the meaning of 7701 and or 26 U.S.C. 6012. As well, the Supreme Court in the case of Wills versus Michigan State Police made it perfectly clear that I, the sovereign, cannot be named in any statute as merely a person or any person. I am a member of the sovereignty as defined in the Supreme Court case Yik Wo versus Hopkins and also the Dred Scott case, which is a famous case dealing with slavery. Further, I'm not involved in any trade or business within the United States by definition. And as such, my private activity is deemed to be a foreign estate or trust, which is not includable in subtitle A income. To wit, all right, and then we go on to state the actual definitions verbatim from section 7701. So let's go over this quickly. This is fascinating. Okay, the United States, what's that? How's that defined? The term United States, when used in a geographic sense, includes only the states and the District of Columbia. Now, there's some trickery going on here. Only the states. Now, they put that in there so that you will use the common understanding, the common vernacular, and make an inference, assumption, and presumption that we're talking about the 50 several states among the Union, the Republic, okay? So they put that in there um, deceptively. So it's the states and the District of Columbia, as though they are two separate things, okay? That's the inference they want you to make, and that's how it's written. So we have to look at what's the definition of states, this is interesting. So we go down to number 10, state. The term state shall be construed to include the District of Columbia. All right, now let's use some logic here. Include with what? What's it included with? If, it's, if what it's included with is not stated, then it doesn't exist, all right? And there have been references to the uh, Chicago Styles Manual, the Federal Styles Manual, that when the word include is used, if the items that it's included with are not a part of the definition, then we can interpret this to mean at the exclusion of everything else. Okay, so if we're excluding everything else, then what this is saying is that the term state shall be construed to only be the District of Columbia because nothing else is listed. Nothing else is included with it. Nothing else is specified. All right, so District of Columbia is included in this definition at the exclusion of everything else. Okay, so more trickery using grammar. All right, you're, you're just, in your own mind, you're thinking, oh, it's included with the other states. Well, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that. Definitions are very specific, and you cannot make assumptions and presumptions based on the common vernacular or the common understanding or the common usage of a word. Definitions in law for a, a word or a term in one part of the law can say one thing. The definition may be entirely different in another section of the law. You have to read and you have to use your brain. All right, so if you're involved in trade or business, uh, you're subject to sub in the United States. You're subject to Subtitle A income taxes. Well, what's a trade or a business? How is that defined? It's it includes the performance. All right, now they're saying what is included here. Okay, now you see how that works. They're saying what's included. 
the trade or business includes the performance of the functions of a public office. So if you're an elected or administrative appointed official, you're in a public office in the United States, District of Columbia, then you're involved in a trade or business in the United States and subject to subtitle A, income tax. If you're not, then you're not subject. So definition 31, what's a foreign estate or a trust? The terms foreign estate or trust means an estate or trust, the income of which comes from sources without the United States, outside of Washington, D.C., which is not effectively connected with the conduct of a trade or business within the United States. So if you're selling copies in Ohio, you are not engaged in the performance of a public office in the United States, which is Washington, D.C. And guess what? You are considered a foreign estate or trust, which is not includable in gross income under subtitle A. They're telling you that right up front. All you have to do is read, okay? So the term taxpayer means any person subject to an internal revenue tax. Well, we just found out what persons are subject, okay? Public officials in Washington, D.C., they're the taxpayers. Therefore, until you can prove otherwise in facts and in law, I am not an individual taxpayer by definition who is required to file a tax return. In the absence of a substantive rebuttal supported by facts and law, please confirm this legal position to me in a letter stating that I'm not liable for this tax return or related liabilities. Well, they won't do that. They're going to violate the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and they're not going to put it in writing because as soon as they did, it would the gig would be up. You know, you'd have a letter you could show everybody, and uh, the gig for the IRS would be up, be over. They won't put it in writing. So you're setting them up now again to violate the Taxpayer Bill of Rights because they won't put it in writing. They won't confirm that your position is correct in the law. Okay. So until such time as I hear from you or your office with the facts and the law giving substance to any uh, assertions of my error, I'll take the position that I'm no longer liable for the obligations you allege, okay? Failure to respond will be taken as meaning that you have acquiesced to my position. And that, from this date forward, the doctrine of estoppel by acquiescence and tacit agreement shall prevail. So if I don't hear from you, this is, this is the prima facie case. You've not proven anything otherwise. This stands as fact in law, okay? So I'm giving you guys uh, plenty of time, 30 days to correct me if I'm wrong in any way, and uh, failure to do so uh, by operation of law puts the IRS in the position of having acquiesced by your silence in my stated position, which is very clear in the law. Silence can only be equated with fraud where there is a legal or moral duty to speak or where an inquiry left unanswered would be intentionally misleading. So those are various um, Supreme Court cases that are basically making that statement and establishing that to be true. So then we move on to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And uh, we outline how uh, their failure to uh, inform you, to correct you, to guide you, to assist you is going to violate the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, uh, even further putting them into the hole, into the pit. So you have the right to be informed. You have the right to quality service. You have the right to pay no more than the correct amount of tax, and they're not, they're not helping you determine that by failing to respond. You have the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard, okay? Are you going to hear from them? No, they're going to ignore you, and so this is going to be tacit admission. You have the right to a fair and just tax system. Well, they're trying to extract money from you uh, for no good reason, 
That doesn't seem fair or just. So we kind of wind it up here by saying that we're operating on the presumption of good faith and fair dealing. Uh, this paragraph basically states, "You're not. You're not. We not, We understand. You're probably not trying to screw me. You. You just got things mixed up, right? Okay. So we'll operate on that uh, presumption. All right. If you have any objections, they must be immediately stated. This is an attempt to extinguish the obligation. And assuming they can come back with any kind of rebuttal that that holds water, which they cannot. Uh, we just threw this in here." Um, just for uh, dressing, I guess, would be the proper term. The offer stops the running of interest, all right? So that's just a UCC concept. Uh, really is kind of a moot point anyway, because the obligation doesn't exist, so there's no interest being applied. And then we go and list uh, a number of cases, which I won't get into here, but the number of uh, case law decisions, rules, rulings by the courts, that establish our position, all right? We sign it on the right-hand side, not on the left, because only dead people and corporations sign on the left, okay? Real people sign on the right, and we put a, 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 a red ink a thumbprint along with the signature to verify that this is a real living, breathing human being signing this, don't need it notarized if you have two witnesses. That's uh, that's biblical, uncontrovertible uh, legal precedent there. And uh, by the mouths of two or three witnesses, the matter is established. And uh, there you go. Give them, give them 30 days to respond. They don't respond. We send a notice of default, uh, basically uh, asserting the obvious and uh, the IRS has nothing to stand on to come after you. Absolutely nothing. So I put together an ebook which kind of covers this in a shorter version and will give you the path to uh, be able to get this document on your own, get your own copy, customize it, make it work for you. This is a one-shot IRS killer. This is my elephant gun several legal premises that basically gives the IRS nowhere to go. So I hope it benefits you. I hope you can uh, get a copy. I wish, get the ebook, all right? Download the ebook and share that with as many people as you know who this could help, all right? People are out there. Yesterday, we celebrated April Fool's Day. Yesterday was April 15th as I record this, and uh, so many people are suckered in by uh, assumptions and presumptions, uh, fraudulent inducement into a system that does not apply to them, and the IRS is stealing the family inheritance from every American that participates in this. So um, this is serious business. If nothing else, this document is a red pill for people to educate themselves. You can look things up on your own. It's full of legal references. You can do all the, the background research on your own to verify that these are the facts and um, use it to bolster your knowledge. Knowledge is something that nobody can take away from you once you have it, all right? Get the free ebook in the link below and uh, take care and God bless. Let freedom ring. Bye for now. We'll be in touch.